So welcome to the uh, to the the G plus North American Focal Group event. This is uh, this is our second uh, such event. We did one very soon after we uh, we we started the the uh, U.S. Focal Group, um, and I think that was towards the end of 2020. So I think we've got about 14 or 15 months under our belt now, and I can I can certainly say that it's been a, a very quick. 14, 15 months and a, and a pretty crazy uh, 14, 15 months with the, with the pandemic. So we've done a lot of virtual events just like this. And um, certainly I think we've done the best that we can in that period of time with uh, with quite a good and, and competent team. So um, let me just give a, a brief overview of the agenda. We'll, we'll start there and some quick housekeeping items. Um, and then I'll do a quick safety moment. And we'll turn it over to uh, Jakob to uh, to give us a, a welcome. So um, from a agenda perspective, um, quick welcome from from me and from Jakob. Uh, then we'll follow that up with an update on some of our G plus activities over the last uh, year or so. I'll spend about 10 minutes doing that and then we're going to open it up to uh, a Q&A session that uh, Mark Marion, uh, my colleague, is going to uh, is going to facilitate for us. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll do about 30 minutes of that and then we'll uh, we'll flip over to uh, a close uh, wrap up and, and close from from B. So we've got a, a pretty aggressive agenda today. We'll have more opportunity for dialogue uh, in that. Uh, in the question and answer session. Um, from a housekeeping perspective, you know, this is a Teams meeting. You guys should all be experienced Teams or Zoom uh, participants at this point, but uh, you can see a full list of uh, attendees in the participant panel if you're interested. Um, please do switch off your camera and microphone unless you're speaking. Uh, please use the chat function uh, to ask any questions. Uh, folks will be monitoring that for us and uh, make sure you ask, you, you state who the question is for if you could. Uh, and then the last piece is, as you just heard from Rachel, uh, all the meetings are being recorded uh, and will be available for you guys to watch on demand um, through the HOVA uh, platform uh, as of Friday. Uh, and we'll make the slide decks available through uh, HOVA as well. So with that, uh, I will jump into a very brief safety moment. Uh, B, if you could uh, pull that slide up, that would be fantastic. So, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about in our company, and certainly I'm sure others have as well, is, uh, is stress, right? So I thought I'd hit you guys with a, uh, a, a quick four ways to surrender to your stress. And uh, when this was uh, initially presented to me by uh, my well-being team, um, I, I thought it was I thought it was pretty appropriate, right? So, you know, we are we are driven by kind of our Stone Age reptilian instincts, which are fight or flight, right? Um, and that tends to uh, influence the way that we react to certain situations. So the first uh, way to surrender is to, you know, is to not do that, to give that up to some extent and, you know, sit back and assume positive intent uh, with, with the people that you're interacting with and the situation you're uh, part of. Um, surrender the need to be right. This one, this one is one that's, uh, that, that, is only learned through age sometimes um, and experience. Uh, so surrender the need to always be right. Uh, make sure you're an active listener. Make sure that you give people an opportunity to speak. Um, surrender effort. And this one sounds a little bit uh, unusual because we don't really want to give up on anything, but there are times where we need to be able to let things go. Uh, we need to be able to compromise and understand. And then I think the last piece uh, is really um, something that we've been doing for the last couple of years as part of the pandemic is surrender yourself to the uncertainty. Understand that it's okay to not be certain that things will change. Um, you know, folks handle change very differently and, and react uh, react very differently to change. But you, you, at some extent, need to surrender to the uncertainty and focus on those things that you know you can control. So just a few things we can do. Uh, make sure from a mental health perspective, you talk openly about mental health. We know that it's a significant issue after the last couple of years for, for many folks, not just our children, but also uh, adults as well. Uh, make sure you educate yourselves and others. Um, be conscious of the language we use. I think that's a very important piece uh, of the guidance here is be thoughtful about what you say to other folks because you really don't know what other people are going through at the time. And, uh, and then the last piece is, you know, we talk a lot about physical health, you know, Make sure we encourage some equality between both physical and mental health. Uh, it's easy to talk about physical health and fitness and all of that. It's it's visible and it's easy to talk about, but the mental health piece um, is is much more difficult. Um, still has a stigma attached with it, uh, at least in the U.S. And the more we talk about it, the stronger we can be. So that's my uh, that's my safety moment for today, and hopefully you can surrender to your stress.
All right, great. So that that's a safety moment. Uh, with that, I am going to uh, turn it over to Jakob. But before I do, I'm really pleased to introduce Jakob uh, is our G plus chair. Um, he started his career in offshore wind uh, back in 2008 uh, when he joined the Siemens Wind Power in Denmark. Um, similar to me, he started his health and safety career in manufacturing and later moved uh, to health and safety manager for offshore projects. Um, in 2012, he moved to Germany and became responsible for health and safety and Siemens transmission, uh, construction and installations of high voltage offshore substations. Uh, and in 2015, he took the role as health and safety manager for uh, Dutch grid operator Tenti uh, and was responsible for health and safety uh, for connecting offshore wind farms in both Germany and the Netherlands. In 2019, uh, he joined Vattenfall uh, and became responsible for health and safety in offshore wind covering uh, all projects in existing wind farms. He's a well-known speaker uh, at many industry events uh, and is a member of the G Plus board uh, since 2020. Uh, and he's held the role of G Plus chair since January of 2022. So we're very uh, delighted to have him here today. Certainly a wealth of experience in offshore. Uh, if Marcus Peters is the grandfather of offshore, then I guess uh, Jakob is the uncle. So Jakob, <laughs> Jakob, I'll turn it over to you and uh, give us a quick welcome. Very good. Thanks a lot, Dave, and happy to be the uncle, uh, at least for, for the day. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think it was really interesting to uh, be involved in the networking session as well, uh, because that's indeed some of the things that uh, I really want to highlight in my welcoming speech here. But before I jump into that, I'm just going to make you aware that I'm, I'm wearing this uh, diversity pin today. Uh, March 8th is uh, International Women's Day and uh, in the uh, session we did early on today uh, for the European uh, members, uh, we, we highlighted that and we had a very nice video that I'm sure uh, we're going to make available on the website so, so you can have a look at that uh, as well. So that's just in case you were wondering what, what this pin was, was all about. Um, as Dave mentioned, uh, I've been involved with uh, G Plus for a while, and honestly, with too many organizations since I joined the wind industry in uh, 2008. Um, I was working for Siemens Wind Power back then, uh, what is now called Siemens Gamesa Renewables, um, and uh, it was clear that the industry was up and coming, but but still very young. Uh, back then, we were discussing with the regulators if a wind turbine was a building. Uh, if it was a machine or if it was a power plant or something completely different. Um, we also struggled to apply onshore legislation that in some cases in the lack of offshore legislation then the regulators would say please uh, just use the onshore one. So for example in the UK there was a rule to have a fence around a construction site uh, and that was uh, at first tried to be applied to us as well but uh, somehow it failed uh, offshore and we had to come up with something different. Uh, we also had to work in, in what I call the void space between legal regimes. Um, and I specifically remember once I was uh, involved in the work for National Academy of Sciences in the US. Uh, this must be uh, eight or ten years ago. And uh, I was also uh, attending a conference there and I asked the question so, uh, to, to a panel of different authorities. So who is responsible for offshore wind? And everybody in the panel raised their hand and said, we are, we are. Um, and that was indeed highlighting the whole issue of, uh, you know, that, that we've been dealing with uh, all over the world, that we have uh, too many uh, organizations, too many authorities, too many uh, bodies being involved. And that, of course, makes it all complicated and uh, means that it takes longer to actually uh, build a wind farm. Every time we entered a new market, the discussion started all over again. Things had to be reinvented. Documents had to be translated. So we had some experience, for example, in Germany by handing in documents and then uh, the authorities came back to us and said, we can't read it. We don't understand it. It's all in English. So it had to be translated. Um, and there would be at least one more other organization who felt responsible to develop that market. So that being the National Wind Organization or engineering institutes or uh, association of safety engineers or whatever it would be <clears throat> that uh, would also be uh, involved in that market. So um, as we discussed or talked about in the uh, networking session, I'm sure 
you can recognize some of these uh, challenges. And there was also the whole question about uh, defining offshore wind, and we touched a bit on that uh, on that in the uh, networking session. The maritime environment exists. <clears throat> Construction exists, oil and gas exists. So, what is wind? And in the beginning, I, I remember being uh, in the beginning, meaning like 10, 12 years ago, um, uh, in my beginning in the industry, I, I remember sitting next to someone um, in an airplane and uh, he asked so what what business i was in and i said the offshore wind business and he looked at me and said that's not that's not a business there's no business um and uh surely today uh, everything looks uh, very different um the wind industry now is uh in many places very well established uh, and we see that uh, everybody wants to join in um, so back in the days, it was really about forming the DNA of an industry. It was about creating an identity and, and a place to feel at home. Um, and for me, as a health and safety professional, uh, G plus became the obvious answer uh, to that question. Now, uh, we did talk about G plus and, and what is the whole setup and, and what is the whole meaning with that? Um, there's a clear consensus uh, among the board members um, why everybody joined in and why the companies are, are members and what G Plus is offering. Just mentioning a few focus is on nonprofit. It's very inclusive and it's a credible organization. It's bringing uh, the industry together and makes it easier for newcomers and for companies in the supply chain to understand and to comply with the industry requirements. Uh, G plus represents the combined knowledge of the members and it does have a global reach. It's independent, it's recognized by the regulators and the data sharing that we have, I, I heard it being referred to a number of times already uh, today, is really the jewel in the crown. Um, it's true that uh, we don't have a lot of data for the US because the industry is up and coming. In, in the US, but we actually have a data set that um, goes back to 2014. Uh, so there's really a lot uh, to uh, gain uh, from that, a lot of insights uh, in the risks. When I took over as a chairperson for G Plus this year, I started uh, that by doing a consultation round with all the individual board members. And it was truly a pleasure to see all the dedication uh, the commitment and all the experience uh, there. Um, they, we're talking about the major players um, and everyone without exemption was excited and happy about G+. So as a new chairperson, of course, that's a pleasure to see uh, a solid uh, basis and the fruits of the work done by others uh, in the past years. Of course, I didn't expect anything else, but uh, many times in my career, I've been hired to sort of pick up the pieces and make something good out of it. Um, in the case of G+, we already have a strong position uh, and the challenge is rather to harness the ambitions and to, the, to ensure the growth is sustainable and true uh, to the foundation. I am confident that G+, will continue to gain influence internationally in the board, we have discussed a number of uh, strategic actions to enable us to grow, but still be efficient, to analyze the data we have collected, but also to add to that and analyze it in an even more scientific way. Uh, so for example, we have now involved universities in analyzing uh, the data um, and to make sure that we keep the snowball rolling by including new players from all over the world to increase that collective brain of ours so we can deliver world-class health and safety in a united offshore wind industry. So with that, I'm really proud uh, to welcome you to the uh, 2022 Stakeholder Day and really happy to be here and to be able to listen in on the conversation and, and uh, not only listen in, but to take part in the conversation. And with that, uh, back to you, Dave. Thanks so much, Jacob. Uh, really appreciate the words and, uh, and and share the sentiment with you too. And, and you know, one of the 
one of the big challenges, and I, and I know this is what I heard uh, in the question from Bruce, is, is really how, how do we continue to develop those relationships? How do we continue to collaborate uh, in a meaningful way? And that's really what we are about uh, in, in, the, in the G Plus organization. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of really good uh, efforts there. It does take time, right? Um, relationship building is, is probably one of the most important things we do. So we're hard at work at that. Um, thank you so much. Appreciate the welcome. I think we've got a slide deck uh, here just to take us through some of the uh, updates and, and achievements. Um, you know, it's it's really been, as I said early on, a, a really interesting year for us, uh, both dealing with the pandemic uh, and also, you know, getting to know each other uh, as a group. Um, I think we've got a, a great group of folks, uh, and you can, you can flip to the next slide. Uh, if you'd like uh, be yeah so if we if we look at you know who are all the members and i'm sure you've seen some of this uh, if you participated in prior events but we've got a great group of businesses right and these are these are folks that are all uh, committed to pro promoting and maintaining that the highest possible standards that we can with regard to safety uh, throughout the life cycle of offshore right this is not just about construction uh, or just about operations it's really about the life cycle um, and these owners and these these folks that are members are all owners and uh, um, operators, lead operators of offshore winds uh, and OEMs. They're also associate members who are developers, grid operators, and uh, and, and investors. Uh, one of the things that I that I heard Marcus say as well that uh, I, I completely agree with is one of the differences is that we are those owners and operators and OEMs and folks that are actually um, uh, that are actually paying the paycheck, uh, making sure that we take care of our people. <clears throat> We're not a separate association. Our membership is made up of, of, of the, the actual business and in the industry. And, and, and that's a difference. And, and we're, not, we're not here to criticize or compare to others because our goal is really to work in collaboration with them. But what, what I would say is that's, that's an extreme difference uh, when, when you think about caring and, uh, and, and the drive for, um, for improvement. Uh, next slide, B. I probably should notice note as well that you know I know we've got some folks from uh, from ACP that are participating from the west coast of the U.S. Others that couldn't make it because of that. We did work with ACP to try to make sure that we were coordinated to the best of our ability, so that there there wasn't conflict. So I know we've we've got that going on. Uh, certainly, as the pandemic lifts, uh, we are seeing uh, a fair share of folks wanting to get together at different events, and and we we applaud that and we think it's great. So um, our our attendance today might be slightly impacted by that but uh, both very good events and forums that are going on. Um, just a, a real quick uh, preview here of the, the governance and structure. Uh, you heard from Jakob, um, you've, you've seen others on the, on the call uh, earlier, Kate Harvey and, and folks uh, on the board um, are participants here. And uh, this is the way the governance works based on that board of directors. We've got the various uh, focal groups, including the US focal group, um, uh, the EU focal group and the APAC focal group. And I think APAC started about the same time or just prior to the US. Uh, so we are both in very early stages of coordinating and, uh, and getting our feet underneath us. But um, this, is the, this is the overall structure and we're supported by the, the EI uh, G plus secretariat. Next slide, please. Here, here are some of the current members that we have. Uh, and, and again, as I said, uh, we've got some great folks here. Not all are health and safety practitioners, um, but all have a uh, vested interest in offshore wind and in the industry. Um, and I'm happy to say that uh, unlike some other uh, industry groups and trade groups that I've been part of, uh, these folks are actively engaged and involved in what we're doing. Um, and uh, and I, can, I can say that essentially to a person here. Um, and we've got, the, we've got big representatives, obviously, from Orsted, uh, EDF, Equinor, RWE, uh, SGRE, uh, Ocean Winds, and then we've got our associate members, Dominion, Northland Power, Shell, and BP. And uh, again, great participation. Not all are health and safety professionals, but they all bring something different to the table, um, and they are willing and active participants. And, and I think that's uh, that's all you can ask for from a, from a group like this. So I'm proud to uh, to be able to chair this group. Um, Mark Marion uh, supports me directly. You'll hear a little bit more from him, but uh, you know he's he's also uh, embedded in our business uh, in the U.S. offshore for Avant Grid, and and certainly um, does the, does the work day to day. So he's uh, he's got some keen insights there that he'll share with you uh, a little bit later. Next slide. Was a little bit of a, a visual uh, with that move. Um, so. 
what is what does G plus produce? Um, for those of you who are familiar, what you would have seen this before, but essentially these are our, our four pillars, right? And these these four pillars we like to say are are really based on data. And you know, I heard a little bit of the conversation about uh, incident data uh, earlier, and um, there's not a lot in the U.S. We'll talk a little bit about that here shortly, but we are using and leveraging the data from uh, those uh, operating uh, wind farms in Europe and other places um, to to help inform. What what we do. So the, the key pieces uh, of what G plus focuses on are the incident data reports, um, the uh, good practice guidelines, uh, the safe by design workshops and reports, uh, and then the sharing uh, incident learning. So those are kind of the four pillars that we always refer to and, and point back to. Um, I won't uh, I won't go through all the details here, but those are really the things that we fall back on. And uh, I think one of the things that makes it valuable for us is that you know it's 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 fairly simple. Those are, those are the areas that we focus. We base it on data, and you know we go after where we think there's uh, higher risk or prioritization based on the data that we have. So, uh, next slide, B. Awesome. So yeah, just a little bit about the data and the data trend here, and I wouldn't I wouldn't read too much into it, but you know what we've what we've certainly seen is that over the years the total uh, recordable incident rate has been coming down. Um, you know I wouldn't get into a detailed comparison with oil and gas. Certainly, we're industries in different places, and 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 one of the things I would say is we we fully intend uh, to leverage those best practices and, and guidelines that come from other industries that can help keep our people safe. Um, you know. So so right now the, the US info is very limited. Um, you know, you can see, you'll see on the next slide where most of it's coming from, but 35% of the reported incidents are, are really near misses uh, and high potential hazards that are being reported in the US. So we're not seeing a lot of recordable injury data coming in from the US. 50% uh, of those cases are, are really first aid um, and, and neither of those are really included in, in the TRIR ca calculation. So for those of you who are not health and safety practitioners, you know, recordable injuries is, is one of the, the, the metrics we use. It's a lagging indicator. It includes medical treatments, lost times, uh, and uh, restricted work cases. So the combination of those three normalized, uh, as Stan said, uh, gives us our total recordable incident rate. Um, you can see uh, in the chart on the left that we've got a, a pretty significant increase in working hours, which you'd expect with all the <clears throat> work that's that's happening now um, and uh, if you if you look at the chart on the right the the recordable injury rate uh, is the is the lowest one so far on record um, in, in 2018 the US sites started reporting incident data into the G plus but again the data is, is is fairly limited at this point based on where we are as an industry in the US uh, next slide B Yeah, so this just gives you a, f a flavor for the kinds of things that we are actually doing in the US um, and, and, that, and that kind of uh, impacts the type of incident data that we have, right? So most of the data submitted in the US region, uh, region corresponds to those uh, observations that we talked about, first aid injuries, and most of them are coming from surveys uh, and vessel operations, which makes uh, complete sense based on where we are um, with the industry and, and the development of offshore wind in the US. So uh, again, data is limited, but what we what we really will focus on and continue to focus on is to make sure that uh, we continue to focus on better reporting and receiving uh, data in the right way so that we can actually make meaningful decisions with it. Um, we don't really anticipate that the data will be hugely different than what we've seen in other countries, but certainly we need to gather the data to, to ensure that that's the case. Next slide, B. All right, and then getting into what we've focused on uh, with our uh, G plus good practice guidelines. Uh, so there's there's a, a fair share of guidelines. Obviously, that G plus has drafted. Uh, the first question that we had as a U.S. team is where where should we focus first? What are the most important things uh, to our business uh, based on where it is uh, at this point in time? Uh, two of those uh, guidelines that that raised to the the top uh, for us were uh, both the integrated offshore emergency response. Um, as well as the safe management of small service vessels uh, used in the offshore industry. So there, there's a whole lot packaged in both of those. Um, you know, when we talk about the uh, integrated offshore emergency response, I would say, um, you know, 
clearly the guidance uh, is used by G plus members already, uh, both uh, out of the US and in, inside the US. Uh, we're finding that from a, a variety of organizations. So the, the guidance that exists is already being referred to by many of our members and non-members uh, in what they do. Um, as I heard noted earlier, um, some of those, uh, you know, those guidelines are, are somewhat heavy uh, UK and Europe based, as you would expect they would be. Um, and our goal is to actually take those and, uh, you know, provide the, the, the structure to identify uh, where those risks uh, and contingency measures are um, and require an appropriate response. I mean, really what we're after is um, moving towards a standard that is uh, at, a, at an international level with has core you know fundamental principles that we're all uh, subscribing to but also having details that uh, reflect the uh, the regulatory landscape um, thank you for adding that um, that uh, that reflect the, the regulatory landscape um, within the country that we're in so uh, just just like uh, APAC, I would say the US has a different uh, landscape and we, we need to reflect that in the standards. So a big piece of what we're doing is going back after these standards, um, looking at how, uh, how, how they do align, um, suggesting revisions to, to them in a way that makes them uh, global in nature, but also including the pieces that uh, are, are US specific based on the standards that we have in place here. Um, the, the safe management of small service vessels, uh, same same kind of principle with the offshore emergency response. Um, you know, guidance is already being used. It's already being referenced uh, in a number of uh, standards, including IMCA and ISO. Um, and uh, it was also used in the UK and Europe uh, by the regulatory authorities. And I know we're, we're, we're having the same conversations with, with Bessie here about how best to leverage uh, some of that information. Um, we, we spent a lot of time early in the year, one, deciding which guidelines to, to go after, but then two, each of the, e each of the member groups provided comments uh, and we've amassed a, a set of comments and feedback on where we think we need to go with those. We have just uh, recently secured um, uh, DNV to take those inputs from that G plus membership uh, and stakeholders uh, to, to go out and, and actually help rewrite and revise those. So another, benefit I think of G plus is you know putting the resources behind this to help um, you know as members and associate members and stakeholders you know we all we all have day jobs right so you know to get this work created one of the great things that G plus does is they provide some resource to help 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 get that done uh, so I, I expect some quick activity on that this year to get uh, those those two standards and guidelines in place for us uh, as soon as possible next slide B the other big activity that we undertook in um, in, in the last year was to take a look at in electrical safety, and, and you really can't have a conversation about offshore wind and not think about you know the electrical safety impacts. So the U.S. group uh, conducted its first virtual safety workshop. Uh, we would have preferred to do it in person, but uh, the pandemic didn't allow that. So uh, we pulled together a group and did it virtually and uh, facilitated by a third party. And we looked specifically at arc flash labeling <clears throat> and, and uh, safe system of work. So in the meeting, the participants, the participants discuss a whole variety of things. And as you can imagine, get a lot of subject matter experts together uh, with varying opinions and you're going to you're going to have a pretty uh, spirited debate. And we did have that. Um, we talked about regional differences uh, when the labels are applied. We talked about who's responsible for applying labels uh, and the difference uh, in the analysis and study process carried out before the labeling. So there's really a lot there to unpack. What we did determine is we need uh, we need a little bit more clarity across the industry industry um, uh, in order for us to proceed on that. So the, the output from the group was really to, uh, to, to work on an arc flash labeling framework that will outline key uh, documents, uh, a clear process for determining label content and placement, uh, and highlights the trade-offs associated, <clears throat> excuse me, with the timing and accountability for label placement. Uh, and then the second piece was a, a framework to be employed by developers, OEMs, owners, and regulatory bodies that will that will help us um, guide um, those best practices and the timing on application of those labels. So, uh, a lot of really good work there. As you can uh, again imagine, we want to we want to incorporate everybody's feedback, and that, that takes a bit of time. And, and I think the workshop effectively did that with uh, with some follow up actions still required. Next slide. 
And we talked a lot about this. Uh, so, so these are really some of the stakeholders. I wouldn't even say that these are all the the stakeholders that we have. And, and this is a big piece of what we what we have done and we continue to do within the U.S. Focal Group is, you know, is to look for opportunities to work together and collaborate with stakeholders. Um, you know, we've made progress with many. We've got regular meetings on the docket with uh, with a number of folks that are on this list uh, and are in regular contact with them. Um, but we, we need to continue to develop those relationships. Um, and uh, we've got an internal group that's, you know, working with Coast Guard as of late. Uh, that's, a, that's an important one for us, especially with regard to the uh, integrated emergency response uh, guidelines. So we've, we've started those discussions. We need to continue those. Um, I would also say that uh, you know we're we're open to other organizations uh, giving feedback and being involved, even if they're not uh, formal members. I think that's a big piece of what we do. Is it's not only limited to to membership. There's other organizations that we're we're happy to work with and get their feedback and make sure we understand uh, where they're coming from. Um, and and I think the the last piece I'd say here, uh, as we've worked through the last year, we've certainly recognized a need for for a resource that's more dedicated in the U.S. to help us kind of manage these relationships <clears throat> uh, a, a little bit better and be a constant contact. And uh, to that end, we're we're actually hiring somebody in the near future to just be a U.S. focused uh, G Plus member, and and that's a big step for us. So again, you know, when it comes to uh, involving resources that we need. Um, that's that's an important piece of uh, us supporting the the membership and the working group with some resources that can help uh, maintain continuity, uh, help bridge and develop those contacts. And uh, I'm looking forward to having that person on board here in the next, say, 30 days or so. So we're we're in, in pretty good shape there. And I think that's uh, that's what we have. I think uh, from there, I'm going to roll it over to to Mark Marion, who again is uh, our director of uh, offshore uh, and he uh, US offshore. He does quality health and safety for us. It used to be with a little E. Sometimes it's on there, sometimes it's not. But uh, with that, I, I will turn it over to Mark, who's uh, also uh, at the ACP meeting in uh, California. California. So he's, he's been kind enough to jump in with us. Um, hopefully uh, that echo won't continue. But Mark, are you are you ready to go? Yeah, can everybody hear me? Oh, perfect. Yep, thank you. All right. Yeah, I had some audio issue on a previous call, so I was trying to see if the phone worked, but it doesn't look like it will. Sounds like you got it. All right. Well, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Beata. Thank you, Jakob. Uh, appreciate everybody being here. Um, yes, I am out on the West Coast at the ACP conference, so just juggling duties. Um, and have been asked to facilitate um, an open discussion. Um, and this one is one that we kind of live um, every day um, in in the U.S. operations right now, um, in in the growth that Avon Grid's experiencing for sure, um, as well as as um, my department. So you know, as, as Dave mentioned about the little e, big e, yeah, it it ebbs and flows, but um, that's that's something that we've experienced a lot of growth in, is the environmental side as well as the regulatory compliance side. So wanted to have an open discussion uh, regarding. Uh, where do we see the safety risks of developing offshore renewable in industry in the United States, um, primarily focused on the people, assets, and reputation aspect of risk management? So I open the floor to anybody that wants to uh, jump in there and offer something to regarding that. Lisbeth, you got your hand up. I don't know, Mark. I'm yes, happy Lisbeth. to turn my camera on a bit too soon. A bit too soon. But uh, but one thing I think is worth mentioning here is the growth that the industry is growing really fast. So there'll be a lot of lot of new uh, people in uh, uh, the different organizations. Uh, there'll be new suppliers. Uh, a lot of uh, those who will be working in the industry will not be knowledgeable about the HSC challenges in the industry. So at least that is a, a key risk as I see it. I think that's a valuable point. There's one thing that my team says when we, we, we have some meetings is that, you know, none of us in the US are an offshore wind yet. We just play one on a team's call, right? So every day is a, is a major learning experience for us and, and not just with the obvious struggles that we have um, and the hurdles we have to overcome with with the uh, supply chain, right? So we're 
we're building a supply chain as we go. So we're leveraging processes in our group to ensure that we we set some minimum standard that that our supply chain is expected to meet. And then as we learn more and our external suppliers learn more coming into the US industry um, and the market grows, we're able to raise that that minimum requirement bar, you know, period over period, whether it be project over project, year over year, you know, what have you. Um, and then similarly on the the employee side. Um, so at the, when I started um, 19 months ago now, um, there was there was a large push to to collect as many as um, U.S. oil and gas operators as possible because of the change in both industries. Ours was accelerating and oil and gas was still coming down. Um, but as we see the oil majors entering the market, that uh, that pool of candidates is slowly, slowly getting thinner and thinner. Um, so it's even becoming challenging on the uh, the employee side as well. Um, Jakob, sir. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, I was I was making a couple of notes, uh, and uh, before I could uh, jump in, Lisbeth jumped in and said, "Hey, it's it's growing, and it's about the workforce, uh, and that's exactly what I had on my list." But I, I wanted to sort of uh, give a little bit of background uh, to that because the development that we've seen in in Europe is that a lot of the workforce comes in from completely different industries, like farming, or they're being auto mechanics, or or something like that, and then they join. Uh, the wind industry and then we send them out in what you can say is a is a very risky environment it's a lot of lone work or being together two or three people in a wind turbine far offshore with a lot of moving parts around them uh, and stuff like that uh, and and that is a risk then uh, you mentioned oil and gas uh, people uh, going over from the oil and gas industry to the uh, uh, wind industry uh, the risk uh, that we've seen with that is that the oil and gas people are used to having a big logistic setup around them, like having maybe an old, even an old kind of hospital or, or medical sick bay or something like that uh, available. Whereas if you work in a wind turbine, you're, you're uh, very much on your own there. What we have learned to see is also that this is an opportunity. Um, with all the risks involved, this is an opportunity because usually we talk about cultural change is very difficult, you know, with an existing workforce that says, you know, we've been doing this for ages, this is how the system is. So I, I, I can only encourage everyone to see it as an opportunity, but it needs to be picked up, but it is an opportunity to install the right culture from the beginning. Uh, I think that's a great point, um, and not just from the, the the workforce perspective of transferring personnel, right? So as those as those companies and those those individuals, you know, come over from different either industries or different you know countries where the regulatory differences are, you know, they they they're pretty significant. Um, but we also need to think it from a lessons learned perspective, right? So the relative value of those those EU and UK lessons learned compared to those in the US. So I think it's important that there be bilateral information flow, not just bringing over lessons learned, you know, in workforce development, but also ensuring that the the questions are heard from a new market. So ensuring that, that the questions coming out of of the US industry, you know, are seen as valuable um, and that historical answers coming forward, um, you know, can increase in the experience from that. So I think it's, it's important with lessons learned, not just culture and, and personnel and operators, but that that information does have bilateral flow. You know, what can you what what can you provide? But what are, what are our needs right right off the bat? So I think the differences in those those two chains of information can can identify gaps that are relative to the growth of the industry because the ex, the the growth is exponential. We all know that. I mean, I, if you told me that my team, department, business unit, and my organization would be where we're at right now, 19 months ago, I'd tell you you're crazy. So it's 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 moving really fast, and I think it's it's that rate of change that was mentioned um, that that is where we need to really focus on because that's going to highlight gaps in I think need from the U.S. market. Um, I see a hand up from uh, Elena. Please. Hi, Mark. Are you Hello. Doing? How are you? Good, and you? I'm excellent. Yeah, no, I was uh, taking some notes here and uh, of course we don't have enough time to go through all the risks that we are finding um, when uh, developing offshore wind farms in the States. But for me, one of the biggest is the contractor safety culture. And I'm not going to say that the contractor safety culture in the US is going to be uh, 
poor, like poorer or uh, worse than in the in the um, in Europe, for instance. But I think that um, at some of them are not realizing of the dimension of the risk that we are finding in this business. Okay, and uh, well, we we. I think that we need to develop a very strong program of contractor management. Okay, and bring in, as you already mentioned, the lessons learned from Europe and from the, from other regions. Okay, and offshore from the onshore business. Okay, because that's a, that is a strength that the uh, US has. So the US is uh, is in the uh, wind farms since long time ago, so I think that we could take that um, lessons learned as well. Okay, another thing it was um, and I think that Lisbeth made a very good point in the uh, European event this morning is that when we are uh, developing standards or guidelines or documents procedures, uh, it's very difficult to find the balance between um, being like international and regional. So sometimes we we want to have something global, but we need to keep in mind that every uh, regulation is different. So um, we need to keep this in mind, especially when we go to the US, of course, but when we go to Asia, so the, those countries have different local regulations and we need to make sure that uh, we work globally, but we don't forget the local regulation or the local standards or the local needs uh, of every region. OK, that's another risk that uh, I find. And the third one that I'm that I'm I want to mention today is the number of vessels operating in the US. So I, I read an article this morning and I don't remember the numbers exactly. OK, but with all these wind farms, been developed or constructed in the in this in the few the coming years, we don't have number of vessels needed to accomplish that goal that we are uh, trying to reach. So it's very important that we take this into account, and maybe the developers need to do something about that. Uh, of course, we are not building more vessels, but maybe um, uh, I don't know, uh, like. Uh, work together with the industry to to improve those numbers and the quality of the of those vessels as, as well okay and uh, i also want to say that we we are finding a lot of risk but we think i think that we also have a very good uh, big strength in this business is that i see developers and all companies really committed to safety in this business okay everybody is trying to share lessons learned to share the experience i see a lot of open discussions sharing information among different companies different regions so i think that this um like area of collaboration is going to help us to be or to work uh, safer in the future in the US. Elena, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I've, I couldn't agree on a lot of those points. I'm living them, you know, day to day now, and 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 I do I do go back to that risk yields opportunity, um, uh, that statement that Jakob made, and I and I completely agree with that. We're living that right now, and 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 everything you've highlighted. But we we've got to take those those risks and really jump on them and say, okay, how are we going to make them better? How are we going to solve this? How are we going to improve this? Um, so there's a lot to tie together there, and I could talk ad nauseum about it, but um, to give others a chance, uh, I think Andy, Andy Goldsmith, you were next. You had a question, comment? Yeah, sorry, just getting unmuted and, and, and such like, and, and yes, Ellen, a very good, and, and, and I have to preach the collaboration thing as well, and, uh, and, uh, and I think that's our strength, but just on my side, I just talking about experience and such like, and and it just occurred to me, uh, you know, it's, it's in effect, the offshore wind industry is so much more involved with the marine environment than than should we say workers in the oil and gas industry. You know, you you could argue a, a guy working on a, on a platform gets on a helicopter, flies out to his oil and gas platform, and if he doesn't look out the window, he doesn't uh, actually see the sea until he comes back again, and uh, you know, and he goes to the beach with his family. So. But it's different in the offshore um, um, uh, renewable sector, and I think you're much more connected to the marine environment. So when you're looking at your training and such like, <coughs> it's so important to uh, 
to, to take that into into effect. And and that's where I see there can be a risk that we've got to get all these marine, all these people that want to go to marine are, are, are in that marine uh, sphere, you know. And they might think they want to, but actually when they get there, they might decide that they don't want to. So uh, so that's a risk. But uh, yeah, yeah I completely agree. And, and and being a mariner by original trade and and by heart, right? You can take me out of the sea, but not the sea out of me, right? So, um, there there is we we do focus on that. I have to remind some of my corporate colleagues and my onshore colleagues that you know this is offshore wind. It's not wind offshore. So we have to take maritime environment into consideration first and foremost in everything we do, right? So it's not, you know, it, it's not just focusing on high voltage operations. It's focusing on high voltage operations in the middle of the ocean. Right. So yeah. um, and then and it's not just, you know, taking taking a car ride out to a turbine, you know, it's it's taking a car ride to a helo deck or a car ride to a boat deck to a helo deck, you know. So, um, yes, absolutely agree that, that the maritime industry, whether it's from the development perspective, you know, our aspects, our impact impacts and, you know, aspects or if it's from the operational perspective and training and human safety. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more that, that the maritime environment is absolutely the primary concern when we do anything. So, great point, Andy. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Bruce, Bruce Gresham, I think you had your hand up next. Yes, uh, to Elena's uh, remark about the uh, shortage of uh, vessels, uh, I couldn't agree more. I actually brought this up in uh, uh, a question that I had uh, posted uh, prior to the today's session. Uh, but, you know, if if I remember correctly, because there's so many different forecasts out there, but you, you know, there's probably a consistent number of around 100 uh, additional, and I'll put them in the category of service vessels, uh, you know, the personnel transfer vessels uh, and the, uh, yeah, the vessels that uh, service the, uh, the turbines, et cetera. <clears throat> But, uh, you know, having come from the oil and gas business and seen the flurry of overbills uh, and, you know, people getting uh, burned when the market turned down, there, there is a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, there's not a lot of enthusiasm of building on speculation. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm, kind of surprised uh, and I know there's some developers on uh, joining us here today, but I mean, if if the vessels are going to be needed, uh, I mean, if, if this if we're going to meet these 2030 targets, uh, you know, the concept of going out with a package, an RFQ that says I need you, I need to have two of these built and two of those built and I'm willing to give X year of years of commitment. Uh, please give me your best price. That seems like that would be a way to kind of incentivize and get this thing moving uh, because it's, uh, as I said in the, one of the posts, it's like a double edged sword. Uh, you know, how stable is the commitment by the federal government to actually meet those goals? Uh, and if it's questionable, then you can see the hesitation from the developer side not to do long term commitments. But on the other hand, uh, if it's going to keep going, uh, the vessels need to be built and probably should have started yesterday. So uh, I, I, I do see it as a. Uh, yeah, a big. Yeah, is risk the right word? It's it's an issue. So so Bruce, that, that's a really good point. Again, um, you know, and coming from the maritime side, you know, of having worked for small vessel operators and larger vessel operators, you know, I've asked the same question, right? So there, I think that, you know, the the building on speculation is is a key discussion about that, you know, because I'm still surprised that the the at the Crowleys, the Morans, the Fosses, the Edison Swests of 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 the world. You know, have been announced plans of you know laying keel based on X Y Z, um, but and I don't want to speak for any developers on the call by any means, but we are seeing that in our tendering processes that more and more of developers are coming in and there's a vessel in the conversation, right? And those discussions are being had. Um, some of them, some of them are really exorbitant, and some of them have a lot of ifs. Um, but but I do think people are starting to get a little more sensitive to to that need, um, and I'm hoping that. 
it's just a matter of time. So there was a lot of false starts in US offshore wind, right? There are a lot of promises, a lot of failures, and a lot of take backs, right? And, if, and that's all before my time, so I can't speak to experience there. But I, I do think there's hesitancy, you know, but and I'm really hoping that 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 those those small vessel operators that when steel hits water, that they go, okay, it's real, let's go. Right. And but I do think it's going to be a just in time solution, and that's a little scary. So, but again, another deep dive on that. So, but great, great, great comment. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah. Um, Alexis, you have your hand up too? Yeah. Hi, Mark. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mark, at the beginning of the presentation, I only saw uh, three US regulators in the lease, and I didn't see the, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency. I was wondering if they are part of the US regulators too. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, the EPA is, is very active in the, in the development phase. Um, and that's usually where, and that, and that cut, kind of ties into the little E comment that, that Dave put out in that the majority of environmental um, uh, involvement is very front end heavy in the US, right? It's very, very present, present and prevalent in the, the um, development phase. Um, but as we get close and close to execution, the presence kind of changes because the jurisdictions change. There's mm -hmm. an interesting jurisdictional relationship between OSHA, the Coast Guard, the EPA, Boehm, and BSEE, right? So it's kind of, as we get further and further out on the continental shelf, influence gets less and less and less, right? Um, but it, if, if we ever had a major incident, everybody and their mother would be involved, right? So it's, um, but to the answer your question, yes, EPA is very present. Um, and it's it's more of on the development side right now. Um, but I do think as as Boehm starts to make um, more and more or concrete decisions in the regulatory space, you know, mm -hmm. and they differ from OSHA or they they support a Coast Guard perspective, you know, I think the EPA is going to be a bigger player than too. I just don't think we've evolved that far yet. But I guess the thing to think about Alexis as well is that the G plus does health and safety and actually we don't yeah. have the E. Um, so whilst, you know, um, lots of the members have it as part of their job role, it's actually not covered by the health and uh, G plus because um, we're health and safety. But our secretariat is provided by the Energy Institute. The Energy Institute have a big environment group and um, they're looking at offshore wind environment matters and so um, and most of the members are involved so we're all talking and sharing but I guess perhaps just not in this G plus uh, format so much. Okay thank you. I would, and I guess I would just chime in too I think it's a great question because I think there there are areas of overlap right even though our focus is health and safety um, emergency response procedures will certainly include an environmental element so I think it's, it's, a, it's a valid point uh, and I appreciate you bringing it up. Thank yeah, Dave that's, Dave, that's a great add on too, because, you know, our, our ERP approach is, you know, hand in hand health and safety and environment. That was one of the arguments we made early on. Right. So, um, yeah, it, it does get it does get attention um, um, regulatory wise. It's it's very front end heavy on the development phase, but in, at least in our sphere, um, it, it has more of an execution uh, component to it. So, um, Marcus. Yeah, thank you. I think my point is really about emerging markets and, and, and looking at the US particularly, it's about how do we get people who don't know about our industry to understand that there are industries within industries? Because going back to Andy's point, he's absolutely right. You know, if you compare it to when I was in oil and gas, if you ask anybody, talk to me about oil and gas, they talk about being on the platform. And yes, there's a helicopter trip out there, but it's about the platform, the operations on the platform. They don't recognize necessarily the development work that goes to get in a platform and position. I think for us, it's the same, but it's almost on steroids because that three to five year period where we're developing these, which range from, you know, I've had this question re very recently about, you know, do we need an SMS because we're going to send a, a small boat out with three graduates on with binoculars looking for birds, doing bird watching, you know, because, oh, we're going to be in the lease area. so. Do we need an SMA? It, you know, we're into that side of sort of conversation even. And it's recognizing that there's industries within industries. So we have the, you know, the, the big capital vessels. We have the crew transfer vessels. We have the aviation industry. We have, you know, subsea engineering. They're industries within their own industries. And where G plus comes in is not to be experts in every single field. But we should know who the experts are and we should be able to influence those experts because of who we are. And that influence, I think, should you know, be used more and more 
to make sure we do get the right standards, that do get the right processes, and we recognise the life cycle that, that we have in front of us, certainly in the markets like the US. So that's just a point. No, I think it's an excellent point. Um, I, f I find myself often, you know, you know, struggling against scope creep and and keeping things, uh, you know, on a path that's pertinent to what we're doing and not not delving into a smaller aspect of 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 our energies and, and our expertise. I and mean, we can touch on it all, but um, I definitely do agree with you that that there needs to be focus placed on on the subsets that actually comprise the work we do. Um, and and I do see that um, um, pretty pretty consistently, but maybe not to the depth we need to go. Um, Jakob, sir. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, just a, a few quick comments on the vessel uh, discussion and and other bottlenecks that might be uh, you know, just mentioning one thing, the Jones Act. That's of course a barrier, um, and um, yeah, there's there's no easy solution to that. Uh, and then that links to certainty in the pipeline, as was discussed uh, early on. You know, because that's what we're all looking for. As a developer, we would love to uh, give out that contract of saying, please build some more vessels. But we then for that need certainty in, in our pipeline. And that seems to be difficult uh, with the regulatory regime. That's the experience that we have from Europe as well. Uh, and especially with the club fees that we see uh, these days with a billion dollars uh, just to get into the game. Uh, that is, of course, not making everything easier. So there might be people uh, over enthusiastic about these uh, uh, numbers. Uh, but for the industry, it's not necessarily a good thing uh, because it also puts a break on some of the development. And then, and then just one comment uh, 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 following up on, on Marcus. I mean, you're spot on. Uh, I, G plus is supposed to be that index where you go to find out what is then best practice. It's not supposed to be the place where we develop new documentation for everything. On the contrary, there's a lot uh, already available. Um, Andy uh, from IMCA also pointed that out. You know, do not duplicate, do not reinvent the wheel. Uh, look at what is already available and then where it's really something new, a new risk that is introduced by the wind industry, whether because it's in a, sp a particular region like the US or whether it's because it's the wind industry that this is something that no one has ever done before. Then of course we need to define uh, something on that. But otherwise, we are more as an index looking at, hey, has this been done in the maritime environment? Has this been done in the uh, construction environment or in, in oil and gas? And then we adopt uh, that uh, knowledge and, and what has been developed over years in other industries. Um, I'm afraid we are at the end um, of, of our time. Um, Mark, <laughs> oh. I know there is another question uh, and I might have disappeared in the sea as as far as I can see it. <laughs> so I'm sorry for that. I'm not sure what's what's wrong with my camera, but I'm still here. Um, we are unfortunately, like I said, at the end um, of our North American session. It's only one minute left and I deliberately waited with, with stepping in because I think it's a it's a very good conversation and very good discussions going on and it's really hard to interrupt. But unfortunately for today, um, we, we need to close. That doesn't mean the conversations have to close because we have the Hoover platform. So please feel free to use the platform um, to, to continue um, the conversation. Also, I would like to announce that we from the G Plus will be at the IPF 22 conference, a conference organized by uh, the Business Network Offshore Wind end of April in Atlantic City. And uh, we have together with, with IMCA um, an exhibition booth there with a lot of space um, for continue the face-to-face -face discussion where we can meet. We also have a workshop together with Bessie and Imka where we, we plan to continue these, these discussions and also get more involvement from the regulator. I think it's a great opportunity. Um, for this session, I would like to uh, thank everyone uh, very much, in particular Dave and Mark and Jakob as well for the excellent presentations and, and participation. Recordings of the event will be available uh, soon uh, before end of this week on the Hoover platform as well. And um, yeah, just leaves to me to, to wish you all a good rest of the day, a good rest of the evening. And thank you very much.